Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you all today to the webinar, the IIA webinar on the future of EU and NATO defence cooperation. Uh, you are all most welcome, and I am particularly glad to welcome today Ambassador Pavel Harczynski, who is the Managing Director of the CSDP and Crisis Management of the European External Action Service. He has been very kind to take time out of what is a very busy week for him in Brussels to speak to us today. I think most people know the, uh, the system and procedure because uh, we've had ample practice over the last two years uh, of the COVID uh, online Zoom, but let me just run over the system for today's, um, today's event. Uh, Ambassador Herczynski will speak to us for about 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we will go to the question and answer with the audience. Uh, you will be able to join the discussion uh, with using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which will be on your screen. And uh, please feel free to send your questions uh, in during the course of the session, and we will come to them uh, when Ambassador Herczynski has finished his address. We would appreciate if you could give us your name and affiliation when you're posing your questions, and also uh, um, uh, if your questions could be succinct, and in that way we will get through more of, of the questions. Uh, with regard to the topic, there could hardly be a more relevant discussion at this time than we are about to have at the moment. Uh, the horror that has been visited on Ukraine uh, has changed everything in Europe in terms of security policy. Uh, the it has changed for NATO, it has changed for the EU. NATO, after a bruising conflict and exit from Afghanistan, has now regenerated its policy and its forces. And the EU, which has been over the past few years trying to develop a more muscular defense policy, uh, has now also um, produced uh, a more a stronger um, foreign policy um, development where uh, there will be backup uh, uh, in terms of military and defense um, policies. Uh, in turn, the secure, the strategic compass has now been approved by the um, heads of state and government, which has uh, considerably enhanced uh, security and defense objectives in that. Ambassador Hershinsky has been at the center and forefront of EU security and defense policy for, for very many years. Uh, he has been um, uh, in he was formerly Director of Conflict Prevention and Security Policy in the External Action Service, and he previously served as Ambassador to the Political and Security Committee of the EU. He's also served in Polish representation to the Uni United Nations and to NATO. And uh, as of now, the Managing Director for Common Security and Defence Policy and Crisis Response, he has an extremely wide brief uh, he is responsible for coordinating and managing the External Action Service overall contribution to addressing external security threats and implementing supporting efforts in the security and defense area to uh, implement the EU global strategy. And this includes work on strategic issues and defense policy. Uh, it includes cyber security, hybrid, maritime, counterterrorism, disarmament, non-proliferation, as well as cooperation with uh, other organizations such as NATO. There is much more, but I will leave that to Ambassador Herczynski to develop that further. You are most welcome, Ambassador, and we look forward to your address. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marie. Uh, thank you for your uh, very kind uh, introductory remarks. Let me uh, focus uh, my intervention on three points. First, uh, of course, uh, ongoing uh, war in uh, Ukraine. Second, uh, our uh, efforts on security and defense. I'm really glad that you have mentioned a strategic compass adopted uh, last month. And third, uh, our cooperation uh, with uh, NATO. Uh, let us start immediately with, uh, with a horrific uh, war uh, going on in, uh, in Europe. Uh, Russia's uh, military aggression on Ukraine has changed the world we knew. 
the unprovoked and unjustified invasion clearly marks a tectonic shift in our strategic environment. The implications of the ongoing war are more far reaching than the Ukraine itself. We are faced with a threat to the international uh, rules-based world order, an order that we have jointly as international community that we have been developing for the last uh, 70 years. Uh, there are also conflicts and crises in our neighborhood, hybrid threats, cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, and much more. European Union and our member states we have condemned in the strongest possible terms Russia's military aggression on Ukraine. We stand firmly by Ukraine and its people in this unparalleled situation, and we provide political, financial, humanitarian, and military assistance to Ukraine. We have adopted massive sanctions packages against Russia and its accomplice Belarus. We did it in full coordination with our partners, including the US and UK. We also, we have unlocked a massive support package for the Ukrainian armed forces through one of our initiatives called European Peace Facility, at the moment, we are talking about 1 billion euro that member states put up jointly in order to support deliveries of military assistance, including military, including little military assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces. This is, of course, unprecedented in the history of the European Union. At the same time, intensive work is ongoing to tackle Russian disinformation campaigns. Because the war in Ukraine is also a fierce battle of narratives. In the latest conclusions of the European Council, so the meeting of uh, EU heads of state and government from last month, our leaders have called on Russia to stop war crimes immediately. Those responsible and their accomplices will be held to account in accordance with international law. The European Council reaffirmed our demand that Russia immediately stops its military aggression, immediately and unconditionally withdraws all forces and military equipment from the entire territory of Ukraine and fully respects Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence within Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. Our leaders also expressed their readiness to move quickly with further coordinated sanctions. And precisely this is what is going on now. Member states are discussing another package of sanctions targeting Russia. They also have stressed that any attempts to circumvent sanctions or to aid Russia must be stopped by everyone. And once the Russian onslaught on Ukraine is over, and I hope this moment will come sooner than later. We, as European Union, we have expressed our readiness to provide support for the reconstruction of a democratic Ukraine. To that end, the European Council set up a Ukraine Solidarity Trust Fund and called for an international conference to raise funding. 
last five weeks have been really unprecedented. European Union stands strongly with Ukraine. We cannot let President Putin win this war. This is why our comprehensive support to Ukraine, including military assistance. This is all happening in a broader context of increased efforts by the European Union to play a stronger role in security and defense. Those efforts have been going on for several years now, but we had a key moment last month with the adoption of strategic compass. The adoption of the compass marks a historical moment for the Union's security and defense policy. It is the first document of this kind, concrete and actionable, adopted by the member states with the aim of guiding our actions in security and defense in the next five to 10 years. It is a very strong signal of our unity and of our resolve, of our determination to act better and to act together. The compass draws a clear and sobering picture of the world we face that is shared by all EU member states. It is based on the first ever EU threat analysis. Of course, the ongoing war in Ukraine has shown even more how challenging the international context has become. The European Union needs to become a more credible and more capable security provider. And the compass should be instrumental in order to achieve those objectives. The compass proposes over 60 concrete actions together with concrete timelines. This is a novel. It should allow us to take a quantum leap forward in security and defense. It should help us to step up our ability to act in defense of our interests and our values, to secure our union and European citizens, to increase our resilience, to invest in the required capabilities, but also to strengthen our partnerships for our own and our partners' security. The main actions are within ACT, Secure, Investment and Partnership chapters. When it, come, when it comes to acting, we need to be able to act more rapidly and more robustly whenever a crisis erupts. Our missions and operations worldwide are a proven asset. Since 2003, so over nearly last 20 years, European Union has launched more than 35 missions and operations. At the moment, we have 18 of them. More than 4,000 men and women deployed across three continents under the EU flag. We will be setting up a rapid deployment capacity, allowing the swift deployment of a modular force of up to 5,000 troops in a non-permissive environment. We will also do more advanced planning, conduct live exercises, strengthen command and control structures, and step up military mobility. The second line of action is to secure. We need to enhance our ability to anticipate and to respond to hybrid threats and cyber attacks. We need to secure European Union's access to strategic domains, such as maritime space, cyberspace, and even outer space to better protect our citizens. That's why 
we will build better tools to fight hybrid campaigns, cyber threats, and foreign interference and manipulation of information. We will create a hybrid toolbox, work on a cyber defense policy framework, and on a foreign information manipulation and interference toolbox. We will also strengthen our naval presence in key maritime areas of interest and develop a space strategy for security and defense. The third line of action is to invest. Defense spending has been on the rise and is likely to rise further, especially in view of the ongoing war in Ukraine. While the increase in defense spending is welcome, we should be careful that it does not lead to more fragmentation, but to more cooperation. We need to invest both more and better in capabilities and innovative technologies, fill strategic gaps, and reduce technological and industrial dependencies. EU heads of state and governments made this very clear in Versailles when they met a few weeks ago. We need to make the best use of our EU cooperative frameworks to overcome fragmentation and increase interoperability. Now, the fourth and the final line of action to partner. The compass clearly reflects the importance of the transatlantic relationship and our strategic partnership with NATO and with the United States. A stronger and more capable European Union in the field of security and defense will only help to strengthen transatlantic security and NATO. This is one of the pillars of the compass the need to ensure coherence, close coordination, and complementarity of efforts is ever more salient in the current situation. The compass is very clear in that regard. A stronger and more capable European Union in the field of security and defense will contribute positively to global and transatlantic security and is complementary to NATO, which, by the way, remains the foundation of collective defense for its members. These two go hand in hand. The transatlantic relationship and EU-NATO cooperation are key to our overall security. Furthermore, our partnership with the United States is of strategic importance, and the compass calls for further deepening our cooperation in security and defense in a mutually beneficial way. We are already working with the US across a broad range of security and defense policy areas and in the field. Building on the EU-US summit statement of June 21, we have launched a dedicated dialogue on security and defense which is an important milestone in the consolidation of the transatlantic partnership. Our coordinated response to Russia's war in Ukraine is a concrete evidence of how European Union and NATO can work together in a mutually beneficial manner. We have demonstrated total political unity and complementarity since the first day of Russia's unprovoked and unjustified attack on Ukraine. President Biden's participation at the European Council last month was another clear de demonstration of transatlantic unity. European Union and the US have made clear to the whole world that we will act on defending our shared values. Friends, allies, and partners look to us to lead further on opposing aggressors and authoritarian regimes 
on making international structures deliver, on building a transatlantic bedrock of peace, freedom and prosperity, and of responsible governance. Today, it is Russia against Ukraine. We want to leave other potential aggressors in no doubt that their actions will lead to serious consequences. Putin wanted to divide us. He achieved exactly the opposite. We have never been more united. And it's not only the West, it's a broad coalition of some 140 UN member states standing together to defend the key principles of international norm enshrined in the UN Charter, as well as in other documents that regrettably Russia has violated. Marie, many thanks. It was 20 minutes. Back to you. Very much indeed, Pavel. Um, that was a very crisp uh, ending uh, in, in the time we, we allocated. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, what was really a passionate address and also very clear in outlining uh, that the EU has moved very strongly forward in response uh, to, to the situation in Ukraine and promoting the new thinking. I have many questions, but I just want to ask you one of my own before moving on. Uh, so many members of the EU are also members of NATO. Uh, so the, the same military forces uh, belong you know, to member states. Uh, when they are acting as NATO, when will they act in, in the EU military arena? Uh, uh, what type of tasks will they be dedicated to uh, in complementarity to NATO, uh, using, of course, the same forces? Yes, that's, of course, a, a very clear point. Uh, there is a, a so-called single set of forces principle. So our member states have only one set of forces, and it's up to them to use, to deploy those forces as they wish. They can do it uh, uh, on national basis. Uh, they can do it uh, within the NATO framework in case they are allies. They can do it uh, under EU flag. They can do it under the UN flag uh, uh, in uh, UN peacekeeping operations framework. Or they can deploy those troops in different coalition of the willings. As I have tried to underline, there is no competition between us and NATO. The more we do in order to improve the, um, uh, those forces, uh, the better for uh, uh, our member states. And in case they are also allies, uh, of course, the capabilities that we would uh, develop jointly, the exercises that we will uh, help uh, jointly will help to better train and, and better equip uh, those forces that might be also used uh, in, um, in, in, in other um, uh, uh, organizations. And it's, of course, up to our member states to uh, decide. There is also no competition because uh, NATO is responsible for the territorial defense of its members. We are not competing on this. And actually, if you look at the Lisbon Treaty, it's clearly stated that NATO is responsible for territorial defense of its uh, uh, members. What we are trying to develop is crisis management. So we are trying to develop a possibility to act outside of the European Union, where there are crises happening and where um, uh, we are called uh, in order to act. And if 27 of our member states decide jointly to do this. Uh, this is why uh, rapid deployment capacity, one of the key initiatives included in the strategic um, uh, compass. As I mentioned, at the moment, we have 18 missions and operations on three continents with 4,000 men and women in, in uniform. Uh, and we want to be in a position to uh, act more robustly, 
to art, act more quickly whenever there is a need. And what is very important, our clear preference is to always act with our partners, first and foremost with NATO. But there might be situations in which our partners, for whatever reason, will not be interested or available to act together with us. In that case, as European Union, we need to be in a position to act on our own. And this is why all these initiatives in the strategic compass. Yes, yes, I can see uh, what you're meaning that we have a wider brief to look where there are crises that are not necessarily uh, being dealt with by NATO uh, internationally. I have a couple of questions, um, Pavel, in relation to uh, how the, um, how the um, rapid deployment capability is different to the battle group concept. Um, I think both you and I in PSC lived through many battle group exercises, uh, but the battle group was never used. Uh, will the strategic, I have a question from um, uh, Derry Fitzgerald and John Bigger, um, former military uh, commander and also former foreign affairs um, uh, official, uh, on how is the military, um, uh, will it be different to the battle group and uh, will it be any easier to reach agreement uh, on its use and deployment than the battle groups? Um, uh, than it was in the case of the battle groups, which have been training for so many years, but actually when it came to the point, there was no political agreement to, to use them. Yes, uh, shall I uh, answer one by one? Yes, please, yes. Okay, no yes. problem. Look, uh, behind every decision, there is always a political will. And when it comes to common security and defense policy, we act based on unanimity. So what we are trying to do with the rapid deployment capacity is lower the threshold for member states actually to decide to deploy. In case of uh, battle groups, uh, it's true. They have never been deployed. And we were trying to figure out why what were the issues. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges was that the concept of, uh, of a battle group was uh, uh, for a new battle group for every six months. And we have came to the conclusion that maybe a six months standby is too short in order uh -huh. for this mm -hmm. um, battle group to be deployed. We are also increasing the size of the force. So battle group was around 1,500 troops. Now mm -hmm. we are talking about 5,000 troops, 5, mm -hmm. which is more than three times more. Battle groups um, also meant a very heavy burden, including financial burden on uh, countries that were participating in any particular battle group. Now we are trying to extend the um, uh, so-called shared costs. So the costs that would be covered by all EU member states and not only by those who are participating in a particular battle group. We are also decreasing the readiness of those forces. Uh, and we are also um, uh, making sure that those forces that participate in rapid deployment capacity would actually train and exercise together, which was not done uh, before. So these are elements that hopefully would make this new instrument easier to use by member states. But to answer your question, behind every decision to deploy, there is a political will. Yes. And this, you know, whatever we come up with, this we will not change. And I really need to remind all our viewers and our listeners that those decisions need to be taken by unanimity. So at the end, you need a, a, a joint decision of 27 member states. 
Thank you. Just a, an addition to that, Pavel. Do you ever see that changing to majority decision? We had this discussion within the strategic debate phase that led to the adoption of the compass. Of course, on our side, we have put uh, several proposals, uh, maybe not going to QMV, which is a bit too far, but uh, so-called constructive abstention that would allow us to move even if one or, or even a small group of member states that does not want to join, but it was too much for uh, our member states, at least at this stage. And member states insisted that uh, unanimity rule should apply. Right, yes, yes. Um, I have a question from uh, a board member in the Institute, Peter McLoon, saying, are there any grounds for hope that international pressure will force a Russian withdrawal in the short term? Or will we be forced to rebuild current international institutions without Russia as a response to this barbaric act? So the question is about the, the future of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, honestly, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's really difficult for me to say. What I know is that we cannot let President Putin and Russia to win this war. And it's not only about Ukraine. It's also about rules-based international order. So what we are doing on the EU side is trying to support Ukraine as much as we can politically by isolating Russia, economically, by providing huge financial assistance, including microfinancial assistance to Ukraine, by helping refugees that are uh, leaving Ukraine and entering European Union. The figures are massive, you know it all very well. And also by providing military assistance to Ukraine. Look, European Union, is providing military assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces. Hopefully, this will end soon. As soon as possible, there will be a political solution. There will be a diplomatic solution. But what we are trying to do is to make sure that this solution is as close as possible to what the Ukrainian side wants. And this is why we very strongly feel that the Ukrainians should have our backing, our support, in order to be better positioned when it comes to negotiations. For the moment, I don't think there is an end in sight. We need to be ready to sustain our assistance to Ukraine, including military assistance. This is what we are doing. And this is what we will do with the support of 27 member states, working very close, cooperating extremely close with uh, like-minded partners, first and foremost NATO, but also bilaterally with um, US, UK. I was attending yesterday together with HRVP NATO ministerial uh, with the participation of uh, four Asia Pacific partners, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joint effort, it's a common effort, and let's hope that uh, it will bring to a positive result, a negotiated result, a ceasefire, uh, and let's hope that the end result will be satisfactory to the Ukrainians. Thank you, Pavel, for that very comprehensive reply. I have um, three questions, three part question from Irish journalist uh, Cormac O'Keefe, who's a journalist with the Irish newspaper, the Irish Examiner, and a number of them touch on Irish interests. But the first one is um, that Ukraine Foreign Minister, uh, Mr. Kuleba, told a NATO meeting 
uh, yesterday that it urgently needed more weapons. He said that three times, I think. And it did not get, if it did not get those weapons, that more atrocities against civilian could happen. And since then, you have had the Kramatorsk train station massacre. Will EU countries respond through the European Peace Fund is one question he has asked. Um, and then uh, the second part is, does neutrality in some member states like Ireland limit involvement in deepening EU security and defence cooperation uh, and EU cooperation with NATO? That's Irish neutrality bringing that into, um, into question. And the last, the last one, um, uh, you mentioned that strengthening a naval presence in key areas was a priority. Um, does that include Irish controlled waters off the west and southwest coast where the Russian Navy had positioned itself and has been operating, posing a possible threat to underseas cable? Uh, you may be aware that we have had a Russian exercise uh, off the southwest coast, uh, which uh, brought firmly into focus the Irish, uh, um, a possible Irish involvement in these uh, geopolitical um, movements. So I'm sorry, three quite different ones in some ways, but uh, I would be grateful for your views on, on those. Yes, of course. Thank you for, uh, for all of them. Um, I was yesterday uh, accompanying uh, High Representative uh, Vice President Joseph Borrell to the uh, NATO Ministerial uh, with the participation also of um, uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister Kuleba, and uh, in fact he said loud and clear that what Ukraine needs now, and now means immediately, he said three things, weapons, weapons, weapons. We have heard him loud and clear, and this is why uh, European Union is doing our utmost in order to support Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian armed forces with uh, arms deliveries. Very early into the war, our uh, member states have decided to use so-called European Peace Facility, an instrument that we have uh, uh, only implemented uh, last year in order to provide military assistance to Ukraine. Immediately, our member states, and in a record speed, have decided to spend 500 million euro supporting Ukrainian armed forces, 90% of it lethal assistance, 10% non-lethal assistance. After the meeting of our leaders in Versailles in March, this figure has been doubled to 1 billion euro. And I can share with you that at the moment, there is a reflection ongoing among member states in order to again increase this figure to 1.5 billion euro. How does it work? Member states provide military assistance to Ukraine on bilateral basis based on the needs expressed by the Ukrainian side, and then they are entitled to be reimbursed from the European Peace Facility. This has been going on since the beginning of the war. The mechanism has been working very well. European Union military staff is responsible for coordinating the needs of the Ukrainians and the deliveries provided by our member states. The figure is big enough also to incentivize member states to increase, to continue and to increase those deliveries. And we know that these deliveries are reaching the Ukrainian side. So I'm really proud that we have taken decisive, robust, and immediate steps in support 
of the Ukrainian armed forces, and these efforts continue. Second point, on neutrality of some of our member states in the context of EU-NATO cooperation. Here, I have to reassure you that EU-NATO cooperation is supported by all EU 27 member states. Very clearly, 2016, we had the first joint EU-NATO declaration, 2018, second joint NATO declaration, and we are working now with NATO counterparts in order to uh, sign a third EU-NATO joint declaration that should set the level of ambition even higher and enlarge our cooperation to new um, uh, areas. This has been always supported by all EU 27 member states. Of course, this cooperation, EU NATO cooperation, is based on certain principles. And uh, one of the principles is inclusivity. So on our side, as well as on NATO side, it brings all EU member states and NATO together. One of the principles is also um, the issue of our uh, decision-making autonomy. So we need to preserve um, uh, our autonomy when it comes to the decision-making process. But based on this guiding principles, full support from all EU member states. Of course, there are some sensitivities involved, especially when it comes to delivery of uh, military assistance to third countries. I mentioned before the European Peace Facility. This is why we have designed two assistance measures. One focusing on lethal military assistance, the other one much smaller focusing on non-lethal military assistance. And I know that in case of some countries, they want to focus on non-lethal military assistance due to the limitations that they have, and we fully respect that. What is important is that all of us, 27 member states, in a very solidary way, support Ukrainian armed forces. Now, the third and final question on maritime uh, security and the increased role that the European Union is playing in maritime security globally, for the moment, we have two naval executive military operations. One is in Central Mediterranean, it's Operation Irini. Another one uh, is off the coast of Somalia, anti-piracy operation Atalanta. The new concept that we have developed in recent years is called CMP, Coordinated Maritime Presence. It's a lighter form of cooperation among navies of our member states. We have developed uh, this concept in the context of Gulf of Guinea, so west coast of uh, Africa, where we had a very successful pilot project. And now, very recently, member states have decided to extend this coordinated maritime presence concept to the northwestern part of Indian Ocean. It's up to member states to decide what maritime area they would like to have as a maritime area of interest. And uh, there was not a discussion and not a proposal to have southwest coast of uh, Ireland as one of those maritime areas of interest. But of course, it's always up to our 27 member states to decide by unanimity. Back to you. Thank you, Pavel. That that was that is very clear. Um, and with our uh, very extensive maritime area, there'll be certainly a lot more interest 
taken uh, in that in the future uh, with, um, with various movements uh, above and below um, uh, the, the sea. Um, in relation to the first point, I think I have a follow up question uh, from Alan Dukes, who's a former finance minister here. And he says, in the event of an attack on a member state of the EU, which is also a member of NATO, where would the focus and responsibility of military decision making lie? I presume in NATO, but uh, I pass that question to you. Well, in case you have a, a country that is both a member of the Alliance and member of the European Union, and in case this country is attacked, I would immediately say that Article 5 of NATO is, uh, is the way to, uh, you know, to, to, to respond. Uh, and this is uh, you know, crystal clear. At the same time, uh, you might also have um, an attack on a member state that is below the threshold of Article 5. And actually, such attack has already happened. It was in 2015 when France, which is both member of NATO and member of the European Union, was faced with massive terrorist attacks. You can also imagine uh, massive cyber attacks or hybrid attacks. And then it would be for that particular country to decide if this country wants to um, uh, invoke Article 5 within NATO or would like a reaction of the European Union within Article 42.7 mutual assistance clause that we have in the Lisbon Treaty. In case of France, 2015 and terrorist attacks, France has decided to act in the framework of the European Union and has invoked for the first and only time Article 42.7 of the Lisbon Treaty that triggered uh, a, a bilateral help on part of uh, uh, most of uh, EU um, member states. So at the end, it's a sovereign decision by uh, any particular country. But if the question is you know, military attack, I would say that uh, NATO is the primary, would take primary responsibility for the territorial defense of uh, its uh, member states. Its member states, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I have uh, Matteo Fontana, who is Joint Research Centre at the European Commission, asking a, a provocative question. Uh, it's certainly provocative in Ireland and has been in the past. Um, do you see, how far away do you see a European army? If, uh, would it be a positive outcome in, in your view? Um, the idea that uh, there would be a European army. Well, I don't see uh, any prospects for European army anytime soon. And actually, I find this notion of a European army rather unhelpful. We have 27 armies of uh, 27 member states. And what we are trying to do is to make sure that armed forces of our member states work as closely together <laughs> as possible, that uh, they participate in our CSDP missions and operations, but uh, I don't think that uh, a, a vision of an EU army is a realistic vision. I know that uh, it has been flagged by some politicians in some of our countries, also in the context of electoral campaigns. It's a catchy phrase, but uh, we are not in the process of the development of the EU army. We are in the process of strengthening 27 EU armed forces and making sure that they are uh, working together, that they are inter interoperable, and that uh, our member states um, are uh, ready and willing to deploy, deploy their armed forces within EU CSDP missions and operations. Thank you, Ambassador. I think we, we took very clearly cooperation and complementarity 
uh, were the were the particular words. I have a very specific question from um, Colonel Dorka Lee, a member of the institute, who says that Kaliningrad is the Achilles' heel of the Russian Federation. And would the ambassador comment on a general Skripchak's call last Friday that Poland should reclaim Kaliningrad? Uh, that might be uh, something from uh, uh, a bit of um, out of the blue uh, you may not have heard about. But Kaliningrad is obviously um, a source of some uh, political difficulty at the moment. I don't quite uh, understand the question. Uh, Kaliningrad uh, Oblast is part of the Russian Federation. And I don't think that uh, anyone uh, in the European Union has any plans to uh, um, uh, attack uh, any country, uh, including the Russian Federation. So uh, the, the, the question is, is very difficult for me to, to answer. Yes, uh, it's as apart from it being uh, a certain vulnerable area. I have a question from uh, Sulagna Maitra from the University College Dublin. Uh, she mentions that uh, the, the, you have said there's no competition between NATO, UN, EU and coalition of the willing. But is there a risk of confusion uh, that there was an, the, of an overlap in the case of mistakes made in Afghanistan, where lines were blurred with uh, the various um, uh, organizations uh, trying to do humanitarian construction and combat. And uh, we all felt that the, the end result was, was not very satisfactory. Um, it's a question of, can you keep the, the lines clear between the various activities of the organization and work carefully for uh, cooperation and complementarity and to not have what seemed to be a, a very difficult exit from Afghanistan? Look, I mean, here, of course, it's a very valid point. And, um, uh, and the only answer is uh, as much cooperation as, uh, as possible. Uh, there are several places in the world where European Union um, is deployed, for instance, uh, along, uh, alongside the United Nations. Out of the 18 uh, missions and operations that we currently have, 13 are deployed in the same theaters as uh, UN peacekeeping operations. And uh, what we are trying to do is to work uh, as closely as possible with our UN counterparts, not only headquarters to headquarters, but also to make sure that the missions on the ground uh, talk to each other, sometimes uh, coordinate, sometimes even help each other. Of course, we have different mandates. UN has uh, different mandate, different uh, focus. Uh, you also have places where we have um, ad hoc coalitions, where we have uh, bilateral presence of uh, some of our member states. So in order to, um, uh, to have a more effective uh, and efficient presence, the more cooperation, um, uh, the better. So this is the, the only answer. And if you look at the strategic compass, it's not only in the, in the chapter dealing with partnerships, it's not only on uh, EU-NATO cooperation, it's also on uh, EU-UN cooperation, where we have a new set of priorities, where we have signed uh, last year a groundbreaking uh, agreement with the United Nations precisely in order to uh, make um, cooperation on the ground between our CSDP missions and operations and UN peacekeeping operations as close as, uh, as, as, as possible. So um, we should join efforts. Uh, we should uh, make sure that we cooperate and not copy. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that clarification. I just have a question that I noticed you mentioned recently that um, the EU was in close contact with China, which is an important part of the solution in Ukraine. Perhaps you could just um, give us an idea of what your contacts with China uh, have produced, uh, if hopefully something positive. Our uh, channels of communications with China are open. We talk to the um, Chinese at all levels. On the 1st of April, so only a week ago, there was a summit 
between uh, our institutional leaders and uh, the president of uh, China. Uh, a month ago, um, I was co-chairing security and defense dialogue with China. This is an event that we have for more than 10 years on uh, on yearly basis. China is uh, uh, a very complex uh, partner of the European Union. We see China on, on three different levels. Uh, China um, is a partner, China is a competitor, but China is also a strategic rival. At the same time, uh, uh, China is far too important uh, to be ignored. On the contrary, uh, we very strongly want China to understand um, our position and we want China to play by the rules. The rules uh, that we have developed over many years together as international community and the rules that have benefited uh, China for uh, many years. Um, the summit uh, that uh, was held with China on the 1st of April was used by uh, our leaders to pass very strong messages to the Chinese side on the Russia's aggression in Ukraine in order to make sure that um, uh, China does not put itself in a situation of um, supporting Russia. Uh, and uh, we feel that uh, it would be in the Chinese interest um, not to let uh, the world to be divided again. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, China would uh, choose to be on the right side of history. Thank you, yes, and uh, we certainly endorse that and hope that is the case. I have a, a last question, Ambassador, uh, that is, is in a different area, but it's asked by Valerie Hughes from the Ireland Action for Bosnia. What operational plans are being made ahead of the UN Security Council vote on UFAR to replace troops due to rotate out of Bosnia-Herzegovina? Are there plans to convert the force to a NATO mission, given the possibility of a Russian veto? Uh, this is an area where um, troops have been for a very long time, including Irish troops uh, still. So is there any thought been given to what will happen uh, after the vote? Look, um, Operation Altia in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina is, is one of the oldest uh, CSDP um, engagements. Uh, it's a very important uh, engagement contributing to security and stability in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, we want to, uh, to stay there. Uh, we feel that uh, there is a need for the European Union to stay. Um, the situation is very fragile. Um, uh, uh, the, the war in Ukraine has actually aggravated the challenges. Um, as you rightly pointed out, um, our presence there is currently based on UN Security Council resolution that should be extended uh, on a yearly basis. And we still hope that uh, 15, member, uh, of the 15 members of the Security Council would see, all of them would see the value to extend the relevant uh, uh, Security Council resolution that enables European Union to be present there. Thank you. Yes, I think the war in the Balkans is not as well within uh, our living memory, and uh, we sincerely hope that the situation there can be can be calmed, if not if not if not solved. Um, may I thank you, uh, Pavel, uh, for sharing so much of um, uh, of your huge dossier uh, that you have with us and giving us such an in-depth. Uh, insight into the, the various issues and the problems and the solutions that are being proposed. Uh, may we wish you well, because uh, you still have a heavy load to carry forward. The situation is, is so grave, but uh, we owe you an enormous debt of thanks for sharing what you have done with us today. Uh, so thank you indeed, and we hope that uh, we can see you back in person uh, sometime soon. Thank you again, and thank you to our viewers, and uh, a word of thanks also to our backroom team of researchers and technical people. So thank you again, and goodbye for the moment. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and a privilege to, uh, 
to be with you um, today and thank you for uh, all the questions. Thank you.